examples whereby the image from Bing has been very, has something happened again? Is everything okay? Uh, yes. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. We, uh, I, it had shown me like an error like that had happened last time. So I was wondering, am I off? No, no, no. Shadow, still... we, are, we, are, we are very fine. We are very fine. Just continue. Okay, that's very good. Mm -hmm. So, um, um, so then we, uh, these are the plugins that you will end up using most of the times. There are others, there are many others, but um, I mainly go into these because they're very important. The card earth and the plex earth, whichever you get to the two. Um, if you're someone who's investing, I know most people may have cracks. I'm recommending you purchase. Uh, you'll find it very important later on. Uh, there's the dot sock tools. I won't go into details. These I can go into further detail and tell you resources where you can find how to use them. There's raster design. This is part of Autodesk and vehicle tracking. And they're normally add-ons that I recommend you have. Raster design is important for importing in aerial images and everything. Make sure you install this. It's very important. Vehicle tracking is also important for having swept path. I'll talk a little bit about this. And then these last two are very important. Nexus and Autotop. If you are someone who wants to design junctions and roundabouts, which I believe is like eight, is like around 40% of uh, highway design, um, you will find that um, this, uh, these two plugins are like a must-have. And I will go into why they're basically a must-have. Um, if you can't access them, try and ask for trials from their website. So if I'm just to go to the web, just have to type in um, Nexus. I'm going to just go to my browser. And you just have to type in Nexus. It's a software and Autotan. It's a software from a company called uh, Transoft Solutions. Um, they have a number of other plugins, but this is, uh, I believe, one of their best in terms of essential, if you want to save time if you're ever using civil 3D, because you've been in situations whereby someone gives you 300 kilometers of a road to design. And this road has around 600 junctions, <laughs> 600. And if you are to go through the steps we're going to talk about, it will take some time. So if you go to their website, they have a free trial you can access here and try it out. I'll go a little bit about uh, basically in the video, but um, it's something that's very, very, very important. Um, now, just to start off, I'm going to start off by just going through, uh, finally, just the final tip. The final tip is project name folders. Like, how do you name project name folders in Civil 3 Now, this is a tip I got from someone who was uh, very good at the time. And um, what they had was uh, the way they would name their folders. So. This is very important. If, um, if you ever work in, if you get the chances and you're currently working in a prof professional environment, try and name your folders so that uh, people can understand the work you're working on. And even if you come back to that same work, you should be able to remember that. So having a good uh, folder naming template is very important. So, um, and I think this is also something Gulf, uh, Gulf in Nairobi, uh, it's something they, they, they have, I think they've been using since 2010. I remember the time when Gulf was working on a project and I was working with them. Um, they had this same folder. I also found it in the UK and everywhere else. So you have a folder where you kind of have your name of the project and then you have these different folders. You have one called styles where you put your styles that you normally use. You have, um, you have a folder for survey data. This is data you're getting. You have a one for a base map, a surface. This is another where you put all your surfaces. Um, so what, what's end up hap what happens afterwards is we have different stages and different information that we're creating in Civil 3D. Now, those who haven't used Civil 3D, I'm still going to go back a bit and just try to go through this in short detail. But um, you find that uh, this is a project folder that you need to have and you keep putting information in different parts so that um, when you transfer it to another computer, it's very easy by use of something called shortcuts. And uh, this is very, very important. I've found that most cases you can ask someone for a file and they've forgotten the name of the file, they've forgotten what they've used it for. So um, it's very good to make sure you have the project naming right. Then finally, uh, the final tip is uh, Civil 3D, when you install it, comes as a standard Civil 3D. Um, but if you're going to become a power user, try and use something called uh, these are called country toolkits. Now, country toolkits were created for different countries. Now, um, 
you can be someone and you decide to create one for your country. So in case you're someone who has mastered the design standards of Kenya, Kenha, Ken, Kenra, and everything about them, you can create standards for your country. So that when people are designing, they don't have to type in everything manually of super elevation and all that. They just basically have to use this country kit. So the country kit I recommend you always use, and uh, this, this will become essential as we go forward in the tutorial, is uh, it's ANZ, and it's, you just type in ANZ Civil 3D, and you'll be led to the website of Autodesk where you can download the country kit. I'm recommending you download the Australia and New Zealand. Uh, they have a very good country kit in regards to the tools. Um, you may be asking, uh, why is it that um, I'm talking about this? Um, if I'm just to go through just uh, what that country kit contains, just quickly, I think I will just talk about that for one minute. Um, if you look at the normal Civil 3D, you will have the standard, but if you look at the country kit for Australia and New Zealand, it has a number of things. It has roundabout, curb, left, right, and all that. These are things that help you kickstart your project before you even, uh, you even start designing Refer reference planes. This is something I use every day. Things that are really very good. Number transforms, this is very good in designing interchanges, math operators and all these. So uh, when you install Civil 3D, download the ANZ country kit, install it. It has some additional things that will help you do some tasks that were very complicated, very, very fast. Uh, then finally, make sure you have a Civil 3D template. Now, what do I mean by this? Um, the Civil 3D template means have a template where you have uh, a drawing already having some assemblies that you always use and you have a number of columns where your profiles are. So for example, main profiles, side road profiles, or profiles for ramps. Make sure you have a drawing. So that every time you're starting, you just need to delete the information you need and then you can literally kickstart it. But all that, you have all these assemblies that you always use for different projects. Um, saves a lot of time and very important. So me, I, would, I normally just start from a base drawing where all my templates are there, all my styles are there. Now, those are just initial ground of tips that I already start with. They're very good uh, as you go on later in your careers. They're very important. You start with a template file rather than starting with a new file and then you import in styles, which members normally do by import. Uh, the challenge with that is if you have styles that have issues, you end up having to import them in. Now, let me start uh, with just the tips of Civil 3D. I hope members are okay. Members, are you with me? Is everyone with me? I, I can't literally go back to the screen because uh, the way the software I'm using to broadcast this just ends up zooming. Is everything okay with members? Yes, it is okay. We're good? Yes, we're um, good. So this is a junction I designed um, recently. So I'm going to be tr trying to take you through quickly through the basics from the basics to the way I came up with this. So this is a junction currently, uh, it has a number of things. One, what you can see here, you have cycling lens that are in pink, you have green, you have a walkway in blue, and then you have this interaction between cycling lens and walkways. So it's basically a channelized junction, but recycling. So how, are you, how would one create this junction using Civil 3D? Um, this um, would vary basing on how, how you'd want this to be done. So the first step you'd start with is members are aware. You normally have like a standard, this is how normally you'd start the junction. So you'd have um, basically two lines of a junction that you're having. And uh, you, someone just asked you, I need to create this junction. So the number of things that you have to consider in regards to this. Now, me normally, what I normally love starting with, I normally love starting with the design vehicle. People need to tell you the design vehicle you're using. So members who are not aware, design vehicles are vehicles that limit the junction. Like for example, we have semi-trailers, we have cars. If it's a rural area, you find that maybe there are no trailers. So basically your junction should be designed from a basic uh, concept of uh, just a trailer. Uh, but if um, you are in an urban area, you would basically start out and you draw lines for the lanes and all that, which can take some time because someone is asking you, okay, I need to have this junction designed. And you're like, okay, I have the lanes sorted out. Now I need to have the islands and you would uh, basically select the islands and you'd say, okay, these, these are going to be made my islands, then offset of roughly uh, 0 0.6, 0 0.6, which could be 1.2 meters. And then you try to maybe chamfer the 
uh, what I normally call the edge lines. And uh, what would happen in this case is you would uh, basically start having something which can start to make sense as a junction. And you can then just filter the edges. This would be uh, maybe filter. Uh, and we just put a radius of 15 just as a start. Uh, so uh, this is how it was. And uh, you, would, you, would, uh, you would start from this position. If members have questions, you can post. And if it's something someone can highlight, because I'm going to be just uh, going forward as we move. I'll have questions at the end. So um, the purpose would be in that you draw the lines, come back and make changes. And then someone says, okay, here I need a right turn basically. And you'd have to make those other changes and all that. And since this is civil 3D tips and tricks, um, I'm normally going to go into the tips. I can show people how to design the junction in detail, but I know that would take up the whole talk, but I'll still try and highlight a few tips. Um, um, the first tip is something that's in regards to, to understanding how path movements work. Now, the, the, the advantage of um, using a number of softwares, let's say for the, for example, in this case, I'm going to go to maybe a, an older program that does this. Um, a junction design is basically limited by paths that are the design vehicles that you're having. Um, for this case, I uh, could have maybe, um, I'm going to just use maybe a semi-trailer <laughs> for this case. Uh, let me use meters. And I'm going to just use just any truck or vehicle. Uh, this is for members who are a, a bit new to this. So uh, I'm going to try and go through this quite fast. And I'm going to just offset by 3.5. So we have this junction that I've drawn the other side. So we start with a design vehicle. And in this case, I'm going to just choose something along the lines of, uh, let me just use a medium truck. Um, when you simulate a medium truck, the way it moves, uh, that is to say the vehicle animation has, um, when it reaches the junction, you have to provide for it a speed. You start and then maybe, okay, you have one kilometers per hour. We're going to start with roughly five kilometers per hour. So there's a way this vehicle makes a movement along the junction. Okay, that's all right. So you find that uh, when you start a junction, the most important thing is basically this arc, the arc for the, I think I'm um, just taking off. Um, so the arc that's basically takes the swept path. I think we're having snap on. Yeah, so we're talking about this outer arc, the arc that you see on the left-hand side of the cars coming. I'm just wondering. Yeah, impressive. To stay. Sometimes these programs can act up. And just one minute. F3 off. Okay, that's very good. Takes, takes some time. So you basically start with an arc. Uh, the arc is the one that's showing the outer radius. And then you have the thickness basically of the line, the thickness of the path. That is to say for this case, uh, if that's the arc, uh, if, I just, if I'm just to move it just a little bit, you find that the thickness of the offset roughly uh, for this case is roughly around 4.5 meters. Now, based on standards, um, this depends, this varies base, basing on speed. So based on the junction you're designing, this would be the first step. So you'd have a junction whereby uh, they've told you a much higher design vehicle. So this is something that I would normally first figure out. And if I'm doing it manually, I would first figure out what's my design vehicle. They've told me, okay, this is the design vehicle. I would know roughly uh, the thickness is roughly around 4.5. So I would offset the distance by around 4.5 uh, for this case. So the first thing you do is offset by 4. Point for the thickness of your of, of your junction. And then based on standards and manuals, uh, you get this radius and apply it um, three or four times. Uh, for this case, roughly, I have a radius of uh, roughly 2.5. So if you apply this two or three times, you would have uh, roughly around, um, you could say around, I think I'll go with 7.5. So you can draw an arc that's tangential to this line that you've offered set to basically uh, create the two lines and you do something around 
Now, what this is trying to do, it's trying to mirror the swept path arc movement. This is how they used to do it back in the old days, whereby they didn't have uh, these nice software that we have that can simulate paths. So the concept was try and understand the initial radius you're starting with for the arc. For this case, uh, this radius is roughly around um, seven. A proper junction would be roughly around 15, uh, 15 meters and above, if you want something very, very robust. I'm going to go back into those details, but now I'm just starting from quickly the concepts. So you know the outer radius swept path. You basically have, uh, let's say, you draw, to draw this arc, you have to select uh, a circle, a circle that's a tangent that can be formed basically here. It's tan tan radius, you select it, and you select both lines. So I want to draw from this line to this other line, and uh, let's start with maybe 10. And what it does is it shows us the outer extreme edges of uh, how that swept path is following. So designing a junction would be you start with the swept path and then you start having this curve and red eye based on the design vehicle that you're having. Then from that, you agree on the speed. This is before you go to the issues of traffic and right of way. That's what we'll come to quickly next. So you basically start with uh, drawing the outer arc, offset based on the, on the, let's say for this case, I'm going to again offset by 0.5 offset by 4.5 uh, for that case. Um, let me just check if this, okay. Um, I hope members can see my screen properly. In case there's any issue, you can inform me. So then I'll just do 7.5 for this case. So get this radius, which is roughly around 5.5, multiplied by three, and there's something around areas of 16. So you can use something that's roughly yes, three okay. times the radius. Okay. Everything is okay? Kev, Kev uh, members are saying that your screen is a bit blurry. I don't know if you can increase the resolution. Ah, okay. Um, yeah, they're saying it's a bit blurry. It. Okay, let me just try and crank it up. Um, that's an OBS. I'm going to just, just... If it's 480, I'm, I'm sure 480 p will be okay. You yeah, have to go all the way to HD. Just, just uh, push it back up. Um, I hope it won't, it won't affect the internet. No, it won't, it won't, it won't, it won't, it won't. Uh, okay, fine. Because I'm um, using OBS. <laughs> so ah, I think okay, it's fine. controlling. Um, actually, I think for this part, yeah. for this part, I could just use share my screen. Yeah, just share your screen. For this part, I could just share my screen. So let yeah. me just um, do that. Okay. Because it, it can work for this. Uh, yeah. Oh, just the only disadvantage is I have to keep sharing. <laughs> no, you, uh, you I have to keep share. telling which AutoCAD I'm working in. Okay, <laughs> share. Can members see my screen now? Yes. It must be very clear now. It must be. Yes, it is very clear. Oh yeah. Do you have to go back a bit or I can start from here? Let's continue from there. Okay. So, what we talked about is you have the arc radius that's outside. Um, the one that I told you, you determine uh, based on how your junction is. Normally, we start from values of 15 going outwards. And then you offset the thickness based on the swept path. So if I put another design vehicle, you'd find that uh, the swept path would be higher. There are other softwares you can use for this, vehicle tracking and the rest. Uh, I didn't want to use those now because um, the concept is just the same. I just want to use something different rather than using Autodesk. Uh, I love Autodesk products. Amazing. So if you have like another vehicle, you can simulate the vehicle that you have for this case. And uh, for this case, we have, uh, let me use something along the lines of 10 kilometers per hour for this, which is quite very rough a junction. But you find that some of the times, uh, most of these cases, people are, tend to drive at 10 kilometers per hour, sometimes even 15, do not show this next time. And uh, what you're having is, so I've just simulated just another vehicle. So, but its arc is much larger. So. I have to offset it by that amount. So I, I normally, we normally tend to leave 0 0.5, 0 0.5 over either side to allow for swept path. Now you shall see how this is important later on. Um, so I'm going to just offset by around five. Let me just go for five now. This is, I think for me, the basics of just drawing the junction in case you're doing it manually. I'm going to just do five. So you offset by five, you have that. Now, when you get to know this radius, as I say, normally, uh, based on experience, you find that normally I just have to get three times of this. So we now have a radius of five. So I just do 15. 
I just do a turn turn radius that you're seeing here and I do it for both. So I do 15 either side and then I also do it this other side, 15 to this other lane. So now what I've basically done here is I've just tried as much as possible to draw a three-point arc. This three-point arc is the one that's trying to mimic the, what we have with swept path. Uh, with time, you will find that you don't have to draw these lines as, with time, you, be, you become so good at this that you don't have to draw them. Um, let me just draw this uh, quickly up there. And then this one, finally, this is the final one, okay? And then this, okay, trim. So now the lines that you're seeing in, uh, in this, which is a three-point arc system, I've drawn it using the three, uh, the sun, uh, the, uh, the tan tan radius. So we have basically, we have tried to reconstruct the swept path. And that's the first important point about a junction. Try and redesign the swept path from scratch because it's very important. Now we have the swept path, you can, normally what I will first do a junction is you first do the swept path and then afterwards you draw this manually uh, so that they create the perfect system. Now just to share back to the other junction. So just to put everyone in context, um, let me just stop sharing screen here and then switch. I think this is the only disadvantage of, uh, of, uh, of, um, of Zoom is that every time you share your screen, you have to tell you the software, you're like, oh, I'm sharing this one. Okay, uh, let's go back to this share. Uh, Okay, so 2020. Um, you just tell me when you can see my screen. That would be very good. We are still waiting. It's coming up. Yes, it is up. Okay. It is up. Yeah. So um, the concept I've just showed you there is basically what did here. Um, you, you get the line where you're having basically the junction. You draw your outer line. For this case, I think this was... It should have been roughly, it's a radius of around 25 meters. Good junctions have, wider junctions have uh, 20, normally 15, 20, 30. 30 is really very good because giving people more lax time. So you draw the outer radius, which is a tangent to both of the lines. And then after that, you draw the three-point arc system I've talked about. Uh, currently, we want to have these markings on all our junctions to guide people because sometimes people don't know how to move in these junctions. So that's why I want to have these dotted lines. So the point is you draw for each of the arms, how basically they move, especially for the right turners. The concept is the same. And this basically gives the concept on how the junction starts to take shape. Because um, the more you reduce this radius, for example, uh, for this case, let's say for this right turner, I decided to have a radius of, uh, here it's 25. If I decided to have a radius of 20, if I'm just to draw quickly through this, if I decided to have a radius of 20, you, you can see that the junction becomes more compact, um, which is very good. And you, you just want to make sure that the two, uh, the two right turners don't interface. That is to say those who are northbound coming south don't interface with this. That would be basically the main concept. So let's say here you also have another tight radius that's something like that, that's very tight, that they're very coming very close. You try and make sure you have roughly a distance of around two meters to three. Based on Australian standards, they recommend that. If you also look at other standards, they recommend. So try and have that offset. So this is how we can design very compact junctions. But that's the basic principle is you need to understand how swept path movements work. If you can construct them from the basics, that is to say, if someone comes and runs a swept path here and you have not used a swept path software, but you've just designed it from basic AutoCAD, then you start to create uh, much more complex junctions. So you start by drawing these, and after you've drawn these, you draw them for the right-hand sides and all. Um, those are basically to put the lane arrangements. Now, because it's a tips and tricks, that's the basic. Now I'm going just going to something that can make this a lot much easier in terms of drawing the junction, because I don't have a lot of time. Um, I'm going just go now to something called Nexus, uh, quickly go through it, just showing you how it draws the junctions for this case. Um, Okay, share. 
Okay, so if you draw all these, you draw all these for the different arms and then you have the junctions. Okay, um, now we're just going to, uh, can members see my screen right now? I think you can. Is everyone with me? Am I off? <laughs> oh, what, am I on? Am I still on? Yes, yes, no, yes. You're on. Yes, very, on. very, 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 very good. So I'm going to just take this away. So okay. this is tips and tricks. Um, so what we have here is just basically the start of a junction. Okay. Um, the details, I can go into them, but I'm going to just use this to help and decide the details. So what we have here is Nexus. It's a tool that helps you design junctions. It also helps you understand junctions. So I'm going to just put the unit in meters because it's very good. And uh, we can use any design guidelines, the number that I've created on my own, on my personal computer, but we're going to just use the default. And I'm going to say to generate an intersection. So it just asks you for, can you select one arm and then another one, and then generates the junction. So what we're talking about earlier is basically that. You see these paths and movements and all that. And um, one arm you can decide based on our, the, uh, based on the lane requirements that you have. Um, I think it's using a uh, left-hand side. So let me just quickly just uh, fix that. Uh, left-hand drive. Let me go back and generate the junction. This, this, so we're now perfect. We're now left, we're all left-hand drive. Okay, so just quickly going through this, um, I'd remove that, but let me just put it back. And so it has created a junction. So um, these are things you can change in the program, but I'm not going to go into detail because they take too long. Uh, so you can add lens, like let's say a lens to the right hand side, you can add an additional lens to the left. Uh, you can also add a lens to the other side. And uh, the beauty with this is you can quickly create a junction in a very short amount of time. Um, I can insert a median, I can insert a lens to the left, I can insert a lens to the right. Uh, let's say this, and you can basically name them anything you want. Uh, that is say insert a lens to the left, and uh, insert a median, and I can insert a lens to the right. I can set another lane and I can then just make these. They've said this is left through, this is the right turn. So the, the beauty with this software is you can create very complex junctions very fast. Um, I know the purpose is, is uh, using Civil 3D, but the beauty with this is that you can create very quick junction layouts before you start going into the very detail of uh, just using Civil 3D to create the corridor. Because what Civil 3D will help you do is create the corridor for the junction. Um, so you can here insert a line to the right and uh, you can just insert a median. So you can insert various attributes of the junctions and you can do this based on, uh, based on uh, a design standard that you have with you. That is to say right turn as normally have three meters through and left traffic have 3.5 meters. So you find that it can quickly create a junction and you can move a number of things. Now the power of this rather than the standard is the ability to move. And I think this is where you save a lot of time. So normally when we are designing right turners, that's normally the most complex part about manually designing a junction is you want the right turners to be where this island is. Because you don't want the right turners to have a point where they can go through straight away. Because that will make it very weird. So you want to have something like this. Let me just insert a line to the left. You want to have a situation where by the right turners, if they are to go straight, they basically end up in an island. So the beauty with this is you can look at an arm and then you move something the way you want it. So you can say, okay, you know what? I want that island to be basically where the right turners are. And then I want that island to be uh, basically much bigger. That is to say roughly uh, a distance of, um, uh, for this case, uh, let's make the island I'm going to just make it roughly around three, uh, three meters. So uh, the power with this is you can basically move that island as you see fit um, until you have that basic design whereby um, the right turners are in an opposite land. 
That is to say they didn't stop interfacing with this lane and then these lanes are going. So then even here, I can add extra lanes. This alone is very, very important when you're designing junctions that are very complicated or for that case. Now, um, you, it also has templates. So uh, I'm going to show just a quick example. Uh, there's a standard channelized, I think around here. Uh, there's a standard channelized junction and it creates it from scratch. You can modify this, but we're starting with this. So now, how, how does this relate to Civil 3D? When you finish designing this junction, um, what this allows you to do is you can then grade the junction. Um, if you're vast with Civil 3D, uh, just quickly to give maybe members a heads up, is there's a tool here in Civil 3D that allows you to create junctions, create intersections. Now, when you normally select create an intersection, it's going to ask you for two alignments. So uh, if you have two alignments, you, I'm going to just draw two alignments. Uh, if I eat, oh, good. Uh, so you have two alignments. When you tell Civil 3D to create uh, this junction, what Civil 3D does, because this has not changed so much, <laughs> even in the latest version, so weird. Uh, you find that it's going to ask you for two alignments. It's going to ask you for a major and minor road. Now, Civil 3D tries as much as possible to create all this information automatically. It's going to ask you for uh, what's the major road. That's what you select first. And then it's going to ask you for the two alignments. The two alignments that we've created. Um, members who maybe are new to Civil 3D, alignments are just like the center lines for the roads that you're designing. And it's going to ask you for these offset parameters and all this kind of information. Now, this is how it creates a standard junction. Now, normally, how we take advantage of this, you want Civil 3D to create a junction for this case, um, but you don't want to use all the information it's creating. You just want basically to use the alignment. Okay, I hope members, I hope members are okay. So you just want to basically use the alignment. So if you select next, uh, Civil 3D is going to try and create an intersection. Now, what it's creating is something we basically have here. And it's creating based on a number of parameters. I didn't specify the parameters. I don't want to go into that detail. But what you do is when you finish using Nexus to create the junction to, because the beauty with this is I can create a million junctions within like, within like an hour, I can create like six junctions, six iterations of this. Uh, based on what you saw earlier on. I can create them and then I can present them to whoever is your supervisor is. And then once they're happy, that's when I come back now to Civil 3D and say, okay, now I'm going to create the corridor. Um, because using Civil 3D's internal tools, they are good, but I believe if you're dealing with a design, a road design project where you have so many changes, it's normally very good to do this towards the end where you do the corridors at the end. Okay? So when you finish this, um, you use Nexus. Now, what Nexus can help you do in this regard is it's, if you go to a tool, uh, there's something which is called design grading. So if you select the junction, it's going to create something we call a surface. Now, this surface is what I can take to Civil 3D to use my alignments on. So I can just basically have my alignments here. And the bit with this is you can select, a, uh, you can tell it the existing ground surface. I don't have an existing ground surface in this case but I can tell you where the existing ground surface is. And the beauty of this is I can create a profile for this case, um, but I don't need to create a profile right now. What I'm mainly interested in is um, interested in normally gradients. I normally want to understand my junction, the gradients it has. This is to show how drainage is moving. But uh, for this case, I, I, I'm not interested in that. What I'm mainly interested in is how do you design the junction first and have the information, critical information that's helpful for you to make a quick decision. So that now you can take advantage of civil 3D tools whereby I just create an alignment here and I add the earthworks along this line and earthworks along that line. And basically I, I am out, I'm done. Within a short time, I can basically have the edge of the earthworks. So that's how I ended up having a situation whereby I could create these junctions in a multitude of short amount of time. I still use civil 3D tools, but I'm just giving you the tips and tricks that with time you have 60 junctions. Now, if I have 60 junctions to design and someone wants earthworks and everything, with Nexus, I can design over 30 junctions in one, basically in one day. And next day I design the other 30 and basically the whole road is done and I have even the earthworks. But if I decide to do it manually in several three, it takes a long time. Okay. So now I'm just going to go to the roundabouts. If members have small questions, like questions, someone can maybe read them out. But I'm now just going to go quickly to the roundabout.
the civil 3D junction tool is good for just creating the surfaces, but I don't think it's very good for creating a very robust junction design. Junction design is a very complex thing. Or we can maybe just have one webinar next time just talking about junctions. Well, we'll begin from scratch. We draw the whole junction from scratch. But right now I have to go through a number of tips and tricks that I've learned along the way. So um, let's go back to Civil 3D 2020. Um, let me just share again the screen and we just go through quickly roundabout. Uh, someone's asking uh, if uh, the DWG is going to be shared. Uh, we'll share it after. Uh, someone's asking, why do I prefer 2012? I don't prefer 2012. I just have all the versions of Civil 3D on my computer. I have 2010, 2012, 2013, 2016. My belief is this. I believe the stable versions are 2012, 2016, and 2018, and maybe the recent 2020. Um, someone's also asking, where does the topo survey data come in while using Nexus? Um, the topo survey data comes in in such a way that you need to provide a surface. You need to insert in a surface. That's the ground surface. Uh, maybe let me just quickly share. I think I need to be looking quickly at the questions that members are asking. As, as, as um, you share your, your screen. Yes. Yes, I'm uh, going to share my screen. Uh, good, good. Um, so um, members are asking, the reason why I need topo data in is, uh, I've shared a different program. Let me, let me share the right one. Okay, I, I would like to confirm with you and say that the older versions are very stable. Very I think stable. From, yeah. I think from 2013, 2012, mm. these other later versions, are, they look fancier, but I always find they have small, small bugs. They can crash. <laughs> that's 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 why they keep they they check a software this week. Next week there's a there's a hot fix. Yes, there's a hot fix. There's this like recently, 2021 has just been released, but it has, it has a, a big loophole yeah. in Dynamo, which I had to yes. update. Yes. And these these are issues that sometimes I find that if I'm doing something very complicated, I just use a light software. Like I just say I will use 2012 because yeah. the crashing rate will be little. 2013, I also have very good hopes for it, even if it's one of the ones I use for this. But yeah. the newer ones, they're very good and they can do most of the work. And just that sometimes they will, they will punch you in the face in regards to that. Okay, you can continue. Yes, there's someone who was able to see. Uh, okay, I can see the chat. Okay, let me just go back. Um, yes. Uh, I'm just, I'm just trying to put the chat back so that I can see members on, on the right-hand side because you find that sometimes that's, uh, that's, that's, that's quite a challenge. Okay. Where is the, okay, the chat is here. Perfect. Now, yeah, I can put it drag and drop. Yeah, 2012. Other versions are much stable. That's very good. Uh, can you create junctions from axe, of, from axe or curved lines Alignment with Nexus, yes, I can create that. That's what I normally do. I just create the alignments and then I attach assembly to that and then I can generate earthworks. Uh, Kaguma is asked about the topo survey data coming to Nexus. You just need to use a civil 3D surface. It will detect civil 3D surface, import it in, and you can use it to do your design. Now, in regards to, let me just go back to a different software, the one where I have a surface uh, in regards to this, not to, Spook everyone out, but just to uh, just show you how how what I'm talking about. Uh, let me just pick up one of my files. Uh, let me just use one of these surfaces. Um, just create, and then I don't need the contours, just the boundary line. And where this becomes important is uh, you find that this is now a surface in Civil Three D. Okay. Um, it's very good to know your slope elevations when you're designing a junction, two point. You just draw something along two points. So, uh, okay, this, I want to show the grid. So I'm going to just edit the label because <laughs> this disturbs a bit. I'm going to just show the percentage. So normally when I'm designing a junctions, I normally just need to know the slope, whatever. I don't do this in, um, I, before I even look at the profile, I already know the gradings that, oh, if I'm putting a junction here, it shows me this side is minus 2.5, meaning it's sloping downwards, and then vertically, it's something like along 8.2. So this is a surface level. 
Uh, the way it works is you go here and you go to slope. This is very good when you're designing junctions and roundabouts. So for example, if I have this area where I'm designing a roundabout, the first thing I would do, someone has told me, oh, Raymond, we need to design a roundabout around here. That's what I'm going to next. Um, I would first grade my surface. I would be, uh, before I design the roundabout, I don't even draw anything. I first look out what are the slopes. So I'm like, okay, I have a surface here. I hope members can see my screen. I'm like, okay, what is the slope? So I know my choose to point and I'm like, okay, it's telling me everything is sloping. Okay, this is my friend. Percentage. It's telling me this is sloping 12.6%. Okay, um, maybe let me make it smaller because I know my round will be there. So it's sloping around 7.9%. Uh, so I would know, oh, wow. <laughs> this area is quite very steep, wherever it is that I'm creating this roundabout. Then I would look at the top uh, because I would try and make sure my junctions are, uh, are at least at a very good slope. So 2.8 is, it's okay. Um, six is very bad. So I would just create a feature line. Let's say for this case, I'll create a feature line here. By creating a feature line, I create a normal polyline and I'm like, okay, this is a polyline. So I'm going to create a feature from a polyline. And I'm like, okay, I want you to do all this nice stuff. That is to say, put it in this site. A feature line is normally put in a site. I want to assign elevations. And what I wanted to do, I wanted to pick elevations from, from my surface. For this case, I'm using a surface that I'm having here. And then what I want to do is when it picks up these elevations, I, I know it's going to pick up this and this elevation. And I know that this surface is going point, point, uh, minus 0.6%. Roughly, that means it's going down. But if I'm designing the roundabout, I don't want my roundabout to be that. That's, I want it to be something like around uh, the case of uh, maybe minus three. Uh, for that case, safer, something at least less than a grade of three. So I hit the new, <laughs> the new version so they can bring up anything. So you have uh, minus... Point six. So what I'll try and do is I'll try and grade. Now, members who have not used Civil 3D before, all those who've not done grading, uh, grading is a nice tool in Civil 3D that can help you create, uh, it, it's, it kind of creates the concept corridors do create, but it can create for you an even surface based on a grid that you want to create. Based on a line that you have, you can offset it, and then you tell it, you know what? Um, I want to make sure uh, this line that I've graded is basically uh, to a certain percent. So um, the number of options grade to distance. Normally uh, I grade to distance. I can create a surface for this case. I want to create, normally I can create, uh, I can create this, the roundabout surface for this case. Okay, I've finished that. I can take to automatically create the surface, which is also very good. What this is doing is that as the, where, when I'm grading, it's going to create the surface. This is even before I begin the roundabout because I'm trying to Look for a very good surface based on grade. Now, if you have right of way issues, you have to keep altering this grading surface until you have a very good gradient. Um, yes, that's okay. That's all fine. So now I want to grade this surface to, uh, to let's say, minus. Uh, I want this side. I want to apply it to entire length. So I want to grade it to this whole distance. And I want to use a grade. So I want to use a grade of minus three. This is what I want to do. Okay, so I'm like minus three. So it's gonna create this surface. Now, if I'm just to show members just how the surface looks like. Um, if I'm just select the surface here, I just want to show you how the existing and the graded surface look like. So I'm going to just have a quick profile. Um, select the surface, uh, just have a quick profile. And this is going to show the two surfaces. So I'm gonna just put it next to me, okay? Just around here. So what you're seeing here is, this is the case we have, okay? Um, the beauty with this is you can keep altering it just the way you see fit. You can keep lowering the line until you're like, okay, maybe if I'm having this roundabout, I know I'm going to have a roundabout here, but I want it to have, because the grid going northbound was okay, but the one going horizontally was not good. So I just want to make sure this is very good. So you can keep altering the grading surface based on what you want to get. So all you have to do is select this and uh, a number of options come up. There's like this triangular thing. I don't know why Civil 3D doesn't make it very big, but they make it very, very small. And sometimes if you're doing like very large projects, it's hard to find it. So I normally dress up around it. Most of the times I dress up around it. Um, so you can select this and uh, you can go into something called the grading editor. 
Now in the grading editor, I can keep changing the slope. I can say, okay, uh, based on my profile, um, someone told me, okay, if I do minus two, you can see our surface is changing. So then I'm like, okay, what I'm going to do, maybe I can lower the, uh, based on this profile, uh, you can see we have a two meter interval. So I'm going to maybe lower the, the, this feature line by, I'm going to lower it by maybe 0.5 of a meter. So it's going to lower everything. Okay, it's still, I, I think I raised it. I didn't type in a negative value. So let me lower it by one meter. One meter, it's minus one. So what we're going to have is you end up having your, your, your graded surface lining properly where this should be. So this is something maybe you can handle later on, maybe to be a fill. So now just starting on how, now we can start creating the roundabout because I normally love the roundabouts to pick everything from this. So I'm going to quickly go through several 3D from 2017. Uh, the, the roundabout tool is amazing. Maybe this is the times where I don't use 2012. Um, the roundabout advanced rapidly from 2017 going onwards. Earlier on, it was very bad, <laughs> very, very bad. I would never do roundabouts in Civil 3D. But now it has a very robust tool and it has a number of templates. So when you click Create Roundabout, it's going to ask you what's a roundabout you want to create. I'm going to create, name this as a trial roundabout. Now, um, these are standard parameters for a roundabout, the inscribed diameter, the center island diameter and all that. Now we have something here we'll called the standards we normally use. Now you can go through all these standards as much as you want. I'm going to just explain to you based on experience standards that I end up using 95% of the time. So you end up using the British standards. Um, I know Kenya also adopts somehow the British, somehow a bit, uh, based on the, uh, the, the manual, the design manual. So you end up most of the time finding yourself you're going to be using TD16. Uh, this is... Uh, uh, basically in the DMRB, that's the design road for bridges and structures, basically for UK. So you end up finding that most of the times are going to be using these two. Compact roundabouts, this is less than 40 miles per hour, greater than 40 miles per hour, a dual carriage or a single carriage way. And basically in the US, uh, the, for the federal highways, you end up using sometimes whereby the UK lets me down. I end up going something about urban. There's a way the US handles urban Urban roundabouts quite really well in terms of parameters. But then I normally just always let's start with the UK one, which is a standard. And it's normally the standard is changing two values, the maximum and the minimum inscribed diameter for this case. So we have an inscribed diameter of 60, uh, 24, and an apron width. The apron width is um, if I'm just create the roundabout here. The apron width is just that extension that normally uh, we take advantage for to design roundabouts to allow for basically large vehicles in the design to move smoothly. So when you've created a roundabout for this case, you now start adding arms. You can always add a number of things. So for this case, I'm going to add uh, uh, the arm. I can name this EB. I name this EA. And expand, and then expand, and yeah. So I can still add more arms here, add approaches for this. Um, okay, then this is SB. Okay, so when Civil 3D creates this roundabout, it's very powerful. The there are advantages and disadvantages. One, Civil 3D creates so many alignments with this. If, like the alignments are quite absurd sometimes. And um, you, you find that they are all very important, but sometimes <laughs> this is where now uh, you find some of the challenge. You see the alignments created, all this. And basically you have to, if you're deleting, you have to delete all of them. But they're created in such a way that it's using swept path together with what we discussed about, together with um, standard roundabout design where it's creating. So you have these alignments that are trying to create swept path around the alignment. So if you ever drawing this from scratch, know that you uh, manually, you, you basically are using ax. Is it all my ax are just acting up today. Okay, so what you find is you're basically just using ax. You have this arc here uh, that meets up with this arc here for the inscribed diameter, and then you have another arc. If you ever drawing this manually, because that, the situations where the civil 3D roundabout will fail it will fail you. The number of situations whereby 
someone gives you something and it's in a tight spot and it fails you. Okay. I'm just looking, I'm just looking at the chat. I don't know if members are asking, but no, my chat. Okay. So um, then you have a number of parameters that are showing you the design speeds that people will achieve on the roundabout. Normally, if you're designing a roundabout, try and have these speeds very low. Okay. Um, because you want to ensure safety of members. And I think it's a tool where I think I love Civil 3D's roundabout tool. It can warn you against um, issues that are coming up. You find that some people can design roundabouts and you find that people are able to move through that roundabout at 52 kilometers per hour. And uh, basically you want people to slow down. So if you, you it's, very, if it's a very good check to help you know, okay, okay, I'm having these speeds and it's basically encourages people and you can check these speeds based on how you want to move. Now, in this regard, you will find that um, this is the, the power of Civil 3D is that you can tell it the surface. Now, me, I normally tell it the roundabout surface. Let's say the existing surface is this and the roundabout surface is that. And uh, because I've started with that, you will find that the graded surface, which I found very, very powerful um, in terms of what you begin by, you always uh, design the graded surface first. And now Civil 3D is just trying to generate the alignments and the earthworks and all that. So, voila. Okay. Okay, so as you can see, um, based on, this is now an arbitrary example. You can see I've already designed a roundabout already in a short amount of time in regards to this. I've started with a graded surface. Those days we had such a graded surface and manually manually have to draw these alignments. Uh, let me just <laughs> make this uh, contours and triangles. Mm, yeah, contours and triangles. I'm just changing the surface style. Okay, so you can see it has already created the surface. And the beauty with this is that I can always keep changing the grading surface, basing on what I want. So here I can already see, okay, if I even begin the roundabout, I have already this amount of earthworks on the left-hand side and the right-hand side. Now, um, the number of things to note. One, uh, Civil 3D has made this very easy, um, but the number of things that one has to understand. Um, you can edit a number of the arms. Now there's information that uh, based on standards you'd have to know. Um, but I'm going to go through the important ones. One is uh, the entry, the entry lane width. These normally, if these are normally based on uh, traffic capacity. So if I'm just to go back to something else, uh, these are normally guided from traffic simulations. Members, if you have questions, you can ask. Um, these are normally guided by traffic simulations. So if you have a traffic simulation software for that case, you find that uh, if you Show windows. Now I have a traffic simulation software here, and this is uh, one called Paramix. Uh, the the number is Vizim and all that. So I have a roundabout here designed. And what happens is is we normally tend to uh, assess the the radius. That is to say, the flare radius based on traffic. So if you look in the Ashto, it will tell you what flare radius to use. The thickness of the uh, thickness of the lane, the width of the lane to use. And in this regard, what we normally do is you check what Ashto displays, and uh, then you simulate that in a traffic simulation software. Now, someone will be also be asking the same issue. How did I determine the radius of the roundabout from 60 to 40 to whatever? Uh, this also is another traffic issue. Uh, if you look in the DMRB, it will show you these design standards. But a quick check if you're if you want, one normally do get your traffic values and uh, put a certain radius, come and simulate it and then see uh, whether it, the two lanes can handle, whether your radius can basically, because the purpose of the roundabout is to improve capacity by making sure it can store the number of cars to allow for sufficient movement. I think this is uh, perfect along uh, the Mombasa road, uh, the number of at grade junctions. Um, it took me, I think, roughly around one and a half hours to get to Kenha. And I was coming all the way from, uh, I think from 
I'm, I'm, I'm still trying to remember the place because I was there last, I was there in February. And it took, you find that most of the junctions were designed as at grid roundabouts. It's known as you go towards the end of Mombasa Road where you have the clover leaf uh, interchange and the trumpet going forwards. But you find most of the junctions in the town are non grid separated, they're just a roundabout. So you find that, okay, now you have to create a flyover to make them grid separated. And what would be best is you get most of this traffic information, simulate it as you play around with the roundabout. Now, Civil 3D has a native tool inside it that can simulate this. And uh, as you go on, you will learn more about it. And that's the, there's something called um, Akadi, Akadi analysis. I'm not going to go into this. Uh, we have, you, it's, 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 it uses the British standard developed by TRL to analyze the roundabout. So normally what I do is after I've finished simulating my roundabouts, I still go back in RKD and put in all these values. And what Civil 3D will do in real time is that it's going to assess how the roundabout is working. Now, the way I do this is I make sure there's, it needs a live connection. So if I click enable RKD, it's going to look for RKD on this computer, no more roundabouts and all this. I think I have it this other side. If I do it now, it's going to take a long time. But what this is normally the workflow that I normally use. These are generated automatically, the lane markings on the corridor. But the most important thing about designing the roundabouts is the approach arms, make sure you understand them, how they work. The design speed is very important. This will show you the design speed of the approach based on what you've specified. Um, this also determines the speed you're going to put as your sign, the signage, basically. Um, split islands, these are pretty obvious. They're just standard values that are showing you the different types of islands. So you can have a split island where you have, uh, basically where you have a zebra crossing where people can cross. This can be added later manually. Uh, this is the split island. This is the standard one having the curve radius. You also have this, we're talking about how far these would be. Um, they improved these in 2019, having a refuge. I know this, this was very important at the time. And I think it's very, very powerful. So if you're designing roundabouts, I think Civil 3 is now the top software. And then I think we have the others. So this is mainly about designing the roundabouts because um, Civil 3 has made it very, very easy. Um, any other information in regards to these? These are analyzed when you're having information that's basically coming from, from Arcadi. Um, You can check a number of these, effective flare lengths and all these, these other values. You, what you normally do when you're designing roundabouts, start with certain values. As you go forward towards the design, you keep getting traffic and all that other information. And when you feed it in, um, the two are working together to make sure that your design is sufficient and it can work. So uh, roundabout design, mainly the things one has to know is learn how to grade surfaces properly, uh, very well. Use those surfaces to design your roundabout perfectly. And the manual roundabouts are the complex ones where someone now tells you maybe the eastbound arm, I wanted to make sure it's entering, let's say, a mall. And I don't want the levels to change. That's where the, 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 maybe the complex part comes in. But once you know those, you're very good to go. Um, now I'm maybe going to go to the next part. I could maybe just quickly go through if members are asking anything uh, currently. I'm going to go to the next part if members allow me. Is that... Okay. Uh, I can see uh, someone is asking why you taught these things at Southampton University, or is it practice? Oh, is it perfect? practice makes perfect? Um, yeah. Okay, the difference I saw what happens when you're taught from a university from the UK versus like a university from Africa, um, is there's a lot of emphasis on traffic. So you find that it was mandatory for us to do simulations and uh, there, there was so, the softwares were there and everything. So all these softwares we learned from there. So by the time we came here, it was just applications. So you'd have people designing roundabouts and they're just guessing the flares. And you're like, why are people guessing the flares for the roundabouts? And it didn't really make sense. Everyone would just say, I'll use a flare of 60. I'll use this. And you're like, roundabouts have to be, uh, you have to design them based on this. So. That's why I want to share them with you. But most of the stuff I learned from university, but how to do it faster and in a way that I learned with experience and maybe a number of consultants that I worked with. Okay, so you know, thanks for that question. 
Okay, so roundabouts I've tried to go. I know some members may really want the details, but I feel I'm going to run out of time. I may even have run out of time based on this. But we can have a full thing where I just design one roundabout from scratch. It's just 45 minutes of roundabout design from zero. But I just showed you the quick method. Grade your roundabout first. After that, use Civil 3D tool. The Civil 3D tool is quite, if you watch a few tutorials on YouTube, they can help you get that really fast. As in you learn this, this, that, that, and then you will be able to output that. And then after that, you start playing around with the parameters. Now, may I just show you the concepts? The important thing is make sure your traffic data coordinates with your roundabout, make sure it's well graded so that you can keep changing. I can keep changing that surface as I want. I can lower it, I can move it a bit, but what happens is all the alignments are updating in real time rather than drawing the alignment from scratch. And any roundabouts and junctions are very powerful. Okay, so can I proceed? So someone has asked, and this is Festus, I appreciate that you're an expert Civil 3D, but come on, just design junctions and roundabouts in Civil 3D manually without plugins and toolkits and make it perfect. Just topo data and voila. That's very good. So you can design the junctions and the roundabouts in Civil 3D. Like the roundabout tool in Civil 3D is good, but designing them manually is normally what I encourage. Uh, the reason why is you will understand what's happening in the software. If I'm designing, I do my roundabouts manually. Um, I use this tool if someone has given me like a day. If they need a roundabout in a day and that. Okay. Okay. So that's very good. So uh, you can, we, we can do those manually in case you want to. Okay. So we can proceed. So I'm going to the next part where I'm going to just talk about. Okay. That's. Very good. So I'm going to talk a little bit about subassembly composer. Someone I think wanted to know a little bit about subassembly composer. I'm going to start with a situation where, where, where you will encounter, and I know every highway engineer will meet this because a lot of people meet this. So let me continue. Let me look for the drawing for that. Okay, as you look for the drawing, Kevin, um, uh, Kiaga, sorry, um, uh, suggest that uh, uh, I know Civil 3D is very deep. Yes. Extremely yes. deep, extremely yes. deep. Yes. And I'm sure even you yourself, uh, despite the many years of experience, there are things you always encounter and you, you're meeting them for the first time or you're learning them for the first time. Yes. And so I'm sure uh, members, uh, I hope you're still sharing your screen. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm sharing it now, just opening the drawing, so I'm going to share it. Ah, okay, okay, fine. And I'm sure members are, members' interest have been sparked. I can see uh, Mogesi is asking, uh, sorry, just a moment. So Mogesi is asking, very good. How can you extract lane slopes? Uh, yeah, let me just open up something just quickly. Uh, I'm just confirming the drawing has opened up in. Um, just to save time, I to open up a number of drinks. <laughs> uh, and, uh, okay. Um, I think I've got it. Okay. As a share, as a share, yes. I can give you. Um, the first time I encountered Civil 3D, I was given a surface that uh, was more or less uh, someone had exploded, had flattened it. Yes. And then uh, I had to uh, use a command called uh, move text to height. Mm. Then after moving text to height, uh, I did the uh, data extraction. Then now I was able to get my XYZ coordinates. Yes. Then yes. took it to Excel. Uh, played around with it, then I'll brought it back as a surface. Okay. Yeah. You're good now? That's because and uh, one has to find a way of uh, working around it. 
question, which I think is very important. Uh, one, uh, I'll go back to ANZ. Uh, ANZ is, Civil 3D is very good. It's something I would recommend members to use. Now, the first point you always meet is if you've ever worked on a rehab road, you find that they've given you a top of an existing road. So we have a top of an existing road and they want to extend that road further. Let's say they're widening the road. Now, the first issue you'll have is if this road was done, like you find that roads were done in 1960, the drawings are not available. 1970, the drawings are not available. You don't know the rate of super elevation uh, that's coming around the curve. You don't know uh, what was used at the time. We are sure maybe the land slope was this. So we want, want to create tools that are in such a way that you can run it and it can automatically pick up the land slopes of the existing road. So you find that at this point, it's showing me 3.03%. Uh, if you go forward, it's showing 1.53. So you find that this may have been a place where there's super elevation or something. So how do you do that in an assembly that's effective? So now that's where subassembly composer comes in. So we use subassembly composer to create very complex assemblies that we want to be intelligent, but we understand what they're doing. So it, a little bit, this would maybe help answer the question you're asking in regards to how would you extract uh, lens slopes in this get if you have maybe uh, he's asking how can you extract lens slopes report from a customized sub assembly okay so okay I'm also going to go to that so now you find situations where you have a surface it's running along the road it's existing and you want to extract the lens slopes so how would you do that so if we go to sub assembly composer I'll quickly run through it uh, Okay, the second part of subassembly composer is here. Okay, subassembly composer is it comes part of civil 3D, and um, the reason why this is very powerful is the number of ways you can use this. I've said something that's really basic. Um, you have a number of geometry. There's a point, there's a link, and then there's a shape. So think of it the way how civil 3D works. That when you apply, let's say, a lane or a shape, it, it represents, it basically has two points. It has a point and a link. So when you're creating something, let's say you're trying to create a lane in this case. Um, let, me, let me maybe just use something very basic uh, here. Is a point, you, you always start by creating points. Now, if you're going to create a lane, you create multiple points that are running around to create this shape. And then you have links that are joining it. Then if you go to advanced geometry, you have an intersection point, you have a curve, you have a surface link, you have daylight. This is other information that you can create to add to the assembly so that it's intelligent enough to understand. If you have an auxiliary point that you need, you find this very good if you're designing tunnels and all that, it's very, very powerful. And then you have something, a flow chart, a sequence, a decision, and a switch. Uh, a flow chart is what we have here. It works by using a flow chart. Um, then you have a number of sequences that you're running to basically create this. Now you can reach a point of a decision. Decision is you're trying to tell the script that if this happens, what do I do? If this happens, what do I do? For example, if you have a fuel situation, this is what I would expect. If you have a cut situation, this is what I would expect. Now maybe to quickly put it in perspective, um, it's very good for lanes. If you're, if you're someone, have you ever faced this problem whereby you're working in civil 3D and someone has asked you, uh, you're doing your earthworks and you have three layers. So, so maybe the first layer is asphalt, the second layer is uh, crushed stone and all that. But when civil 3D generates the report, you just have pavement one, pavement two, pavement three, and sometimes you have to figure out how that's working. So when you're in these situations whereby you can create your personal assembly, for example, in this case, uh, we have a lane. We have this case where we were trying to create a pavement that has more than like five layers. You find Civil 3D has, I think, a limitation of around five. So you want to create six layers, but you also want them to make sure that they work really well. So the beauty with this is you can create uh, pavements whereby you can create maybe and you say this is going to be asphalt. Okay. And what will happen is in Civil 3D, someone will know because you create this new for every project you're working on, you name this asphalt, this, so that when you're generating your 
quantities, they are really perfect. So just to go through this is we have a decision. We're trying to say, okay, how uh, basically, how does this work in this case? Because we're trying to create um, a, we call it an assembly that has different pavement layers. Now remember all these different pavement layers have to understand a number of things. We're trying to create a decision. We start with something where we're asking the pavement layer to what point do you want to use? Do you want to use a marked point or you want to use another point? This is the first decision. You ever seen when you're creating assembly in civil 3D? You always start by selecting an assembly and then uh, you attach, you, you, you start by selecting the main assembly. And after that, you attach the sub assembly. Now, this is what you're trying to tell it to do. Okay, if you create that, what do you want to do? In that, you tell it, okay, now I want you to create a point P1. If we are to look here, for this case, there's a point P1. After that, you want it to create a point P2. There's a point P2 here. After that, you want to create a link one. Now, link one is basically what's joining the two. So you find that we've created the first top layer. Then after that, you can give a number of issues where you're trying to say, okay, what's the width? The width is a number of values. Now, the values we create, they are created by input and output parameters. So if you have input parameters in sub-assemblies, is, these are values that someone is going to input in the program, that is to say when they are inside the sub-assembly, and then the number of output parameters that basically the sub-assembly will output itself. So for this case, um, we had a situation whereby um, it was, we wanted to have different pavement layers, having different names, but also being able to function with the different widths, because they're basically standard calculations. We're trying to tell it, okay, where should I get the value for the slope? You want to basically it to get the value for the slope from one of these values. Let's say you tell someone the default slope. I want the default slope to be 3%. So you'd ask it, what would I want the slope to be and you basically put in the default slope in this case so if we go back we did this for this for pavement one pavement two pavement three pavement four pavement five and this you're doing it for all the different layers now the tricky bit came in when you're trying to do uh, elements of super elevation now if you try to do super elevation the challenge you have with super elevation is you have to use some complex code um, that i had to get from the autodesk website and what that code did was it tried to create super elevation. Otherwise, if you have this lane as it is, if you have this assembly as it is here, um, it's going to create a challenge. So when you finish creating this sub-assembly, I don't want to go into the details because it's, it's another long discussion, but I just want to quickly go through tips and tricks. Um, you save this sub-assembly as a PKT file on the desktop, and then we name this as, a, let's say, trial. You save it. And then you go back in Civil 3D, uh, for this case, let me stop, and then import. Share. Okay, so you go back in Civil 3D, and then you import. Uh, you create uh, a palette for the sub-assembly that you're creating. Uh, for this case, I'm going to just name it Ray, and I'm going to import in here subassembly uh, called trio PKT. So when it comes in, it's going to create this, a lane that's showing uh, basically the six different layers. And if you try to assert in a, an assembly and then you insert it in, let's say I'm going to just put that there, and then you choose the side, maybe right-hand side, now, uh, this, this will happen because of just the display style. So if you use uh, the typical NZ style, it will show the different pavement layers for this. But it's now just showing uh, just a dot because of the style I'm using. I would have to go back and import styles in. But I, I, I don't really do that right now. But when you import in the styles, it will show the different layers. So if you go back here, you can see all the parameters we created the other side are there. So, um, okay, what did I do? Um, okay, I didn't save it. Let me go to Subassembly Composer and input the inputs and outputs. The reason why they're not coming up here um, is cause it wants you to use properties. <laughs> uh, if 
very interesting. Okay. Okay, let me just try adding styles. Boom. Let me just save it as a trial quickly. This is why I normally love starting from a template <laughs> because it will pick up from the template by default. Now I have to, the ends has to pick up where I, I think let me just change the style to all codes to display all the codes actually. Supporting styles from the main drawing. That's why it's taking some time. Otherwise, hope members are fine. I think I may have kept, I'm, I'm really, let me, okay, just importing everything. No, oh, this does take some time sometimes. Oh, never. Come on, come on, come on. Okay, I can be checking out what members are saying. Uh, let me go back to the chat. This works. Would I mind sharing my template? <laughs> Daniel, that's something we can talk about later. There's one I can share. Um, I will tell you where you can get the templates from and most of the information. And I'm going to be trying to winding down. I'm going to find out I have like another five minutes, one more. I'll just talk about interchanges as the last uh, option that we're talking about. Um, would you mind sharing your template? I'll just highlight it on where you can get the template from. Okay. Someone asked me, I know Kagunya's questions. I know Carl Sachs. Yeah, that's very good. It's uh, something I think we just have to have a one-on-one -on -one because uh, it's basically, you have to handle two issues. One, creating the corridor, and two, creating the perfect drainage for the cul-de-sac, which would take some time. How do I edit view frames for it to create PP at definite intervals? For example, at 1.5. Now this, you can use the current tools, but I'm going to recommend you use Dynamo for this. Same thing for how can I extract lens slopes from a report. I'm going to still recommend, Hannah, we wanted it in Civil 3D 2018, which didn't have Dynamo. Uh, this is something we can discuss off after this so that we don't have everyone. So let me go to the final bit, which is interchanges. Uh, interchanges, um, they are kind of a junction type, but they are grid separated. Um, how would you use Civil 3D to design interchanges? Uh, so I'm going to open up one drawing that has basically an interchange, just a standard trumpet. Oh, okay, let me admit. Okay. Uh, Stop sharing. Can you see my screen? Does it have the interchange? I don't know which one's sharing. Uh, let me just stop and then just go back to the one with the interchange. As you share your screen. Okay, I think it's coming up. We have five more, I have five, six minutes. By like five, three minutes, Past 10, I'm, I'm done. I'll be done. Okay. Members want more questions, can ask. Okay. Yeah. Oh. Come, come, come. Share your screen. Uh, this is tips and checks. Okay. Okay. Uh, Someone may ask where have I gone here? This is slightly different. Um, I'm still going to go back about saving time and all, okay? Um, the reason why I talk about this a lot is, this is what they asked me to do, uh, tips and tricks. If I go into the details of time. So I'm going to just uh, create this from scratch. I'm going to start creating a trumpet interchange. A trumpet interchange is basically uh, a form of grid separated junction whereby you have a number of parameters that are connecting. That is to say, you have ramps in all directions. My assumption is members are aware of interchanges. The, 
So I'm going to just, just show it. Otherwise, if I go into how the different noses and all that, that would take too long. I'm going to just show you how do you do something like this very quick and very fast. And then by the time you go back, you, you're, already, you're already very quick. Um, so I'm going to just, this is another software. Now, where did I learn this? Uh, this I learned with uh, Koreans, working with Koreans in regards to designing uh, three expressways, the ones we've been working with. And you find that, I'll repeat this, the tools you use, and I'm going to emphasize this. I wish I knew this when I was starting out. You need to learn effective tools on how to do your work, to save time. If someone's going to spend the whole day just coming up with a draft, yet in like 20 minutes, you can come up with a quick draft. And it, it's very, very important. You need to save time so that you can do other things. Um, for this case, I'm going to just show this. So this is a tool called Beam Road. Um, the purpose is to create interchanges quite really fast. And uh, the things you normally have to do are quite very easy. You just have to select, let's say you give the name and you give the interchange a name. What I normally do, I design all my alignments in civil 3D. That is to say the vertical horizontal alignment, the vertical and the horizontal alignment. I design that in civil 3D because it's much faster. So within like, Two minutes, you have the horizontal alignment for this and the horizontal alignment for the minor road. And why I use this is just to quickly assess. I have three minutes. So I decide the interchange. I take the interchange I like. So we can have two types of interchange. You can do trumpets A and B. So people may be asking, when do you use A or when do you use this? Um, depending where the major traffic is coming from. If the major traffic is coming, let's say for the first case, if from the westbound if the traffic is coming from the west is most of it is going and turning to the minor road uh, you find that you end up using we call this loop a kind of trumpet interchange loop b is majority of the traffic is coming from the minor road and is going to the eastbound it's not it's not the other way around so that's the two cases in which you can use uh whether you use loop a or loop b you just don't end up using any trumpet based on how you want it's basically based on traffic so here I can choose the mainline alignment. Uh, this is the information I prepared earlier on. Um, so you choose the mainline alignment, you choose the alignment of the minor road. And in regards to this, what you end up having is you choose the type that you want. So I'm gonna maybe just make it a clover leaf. And uh, I press next. We can do this manually if someone really wants. Uh, but I, I'm just showing you how, how I've been able to do things very, very fast. Because this is that I wish I learned this earlier on. Um, so uh, let's go back a bit. Let's go back a bit. Um, so we have a ramp. You determine the speed of a ramp. First case, I'm going to do um, 50 kilometers per hour. No, my super elevation, I love to do 7% for this. Minimum radius, this is pretty much the standard. I think Kenya, I think the minimum radius for 50 is 90. Should be 90. I think Ashley is 100. Uh, 50 for this case, I'm going to use 50. And um, minimum radius. Uh, for this case, I'm going to use 100. Okay, the loops. Uh, minimum grades, this is 7%. You input most of these values. Now, these values come from your manuals, and uh, the weaving length comes from it, the HCM in case, uh, the HCM, the highways capacity manual, in case you need to understand the spacing based on the volumes of traffic. Now, once you have all the information you need basically for designing the interchange. I'm just assuming someone is aware of this for someone who does this kind of work. I'm just trying to show them the tips. You input in all the different information in regards to the downgrades. This affects your stopping side distance. So you have to make sure you're putting this properly. You specify the way the taper is connecting, whether it's a parallel or uh, a taper type. Then finally, you basically specify the length. Normally this is standard, 50. When my line it's normally 60. You can type in um, a acceleration length, roughly maybe 180. This is based on design speed. These all come from design standards. Once you're aware of the values you need from the design standard, you can quickly come and input them in, uh, input all the information you need. And the beauty with this is you can input in all the other. Now it's asking for how wide the roads are, which I don't want to put in because I've run out of time. And uh, basically after you finish completing, what will happen is it's going to help you create something that can be a very good starting point. Basically in, in terms of the vertical, the horizontal, uh, by the time I go back to civil 3D, I'm able to begin. Now I can create everything from scratch, but like a full interchange used to take me like a full week designing one interchange. Now we have designed a cloverleaf. I think 
it has a trump pattern globally. This used to take me a full week, but now it can take like two hours and then a day of designing a full interchange and you have it ready. Now, because I've run out of time, I'm going to just leave the next period for just questions for members. Okay. Sorry, maybe some of the information may have been complex for members, or maybe it's a starter. Uh, the software is called Beam Road. Okay, for anyone who's interested, that's the name of the software. Okay, so members who have questions, you can ask. I can quickly go through some already that members have maybe tried asking. For the cow suck, we just need to sit down and do it, because something much more complex. All right. Uh, thank you so much for the session. Uh, I'm sure guys have so many questions, but I'm not sure we will be able to answer uh, all of them. Lokumbur is asking, what is under hydraulics? Yes, uh, what's under hydraulics is, is he asking of this software or he is asking? Um... I'm not sure because he just asked a general question. So maybe you can it's if, if he's asking about the software and hydraulics, you can input pipe culverts and all that other stuff. Um, it's bridges, like it's very powerful. If you know how to create this, uh, if you know how to create this in civil 3D is under hydraulics, um, you can create like a good amount of information in terms of uh, pipe culverts, bridges, and all that in terms of the way it works. Now, why I love this is I can, I still use the civil 3D pipes, but when I'm in preliminary design, when I'm in preliminary design, I normally use this always. And then when I'm going to now feasibility study and detailed design, that's when now I push back to civil 3D and whatever. But this is very good for doing preliminary design because it's quickly to add a number of things. You can quickly add a bridge. You can quickly add uh, bridges, box culverts, tunnels, pipes, and these are added automatically to the pipe, to the profiles. If you know Civil 3D, adding a lot of this information like bridges, tunnels, 2021 has introduced a new feature of adding bridges to the profile. Wow, that was very good. Uh, those days you had to go through a long process. Now you don't have to, because 2021 added it. Okay, questions? Are there any more questions? <laughs> I don't see any more questions, but I uh, would suggest that uh, after the session, you, since you, you can see that uh, very many people are showing interest, yeah. you will share the, um, uh, the, is it the handle or the link to, to your YouTube channel so that okay. uh, members can follow you? Share that. Okay, then, so, yeah. okay, someone else, are there def default codes for the different versions? Uh, of a subassembly composer. Yes, they are. Um, one, the default codes uh, work with, one can be with the styles, two with the version. Like you find that if something worked in, an, you can open something in a newer version in an older version. That's, that's, that's the problem I have with it. And uh, where can we get them? I can share them. Now I'm going to just share my, my YouTube channel and website. Uh, my website is highwayacademy.net. Uh, it's it's uh, something whereby, because most people have been trying to ask me how I can teach them if they want to learn something from start to finish, that's a website I've created for members to, they can go to highwayacademy.net. Um, most of the courses are being launched at the end of this month. They're already there, but they're being launched. Uh, it's highwayacademy.net. And uh, I'm putting most of the information there. I'm putting the templates there. The reason is um, some of the templates have stuff that has taken me like 10 years. And it's not something you want all over the place, uh, but it's something you can share with a few members who are really keen and they really want to take their, like, their design to the next level. Why are you having very clean uh, profiles and layouts? I wish I could share some of them here and show you some. Why you create very clean profile and layouts that really look professional. Someone looks at it and just says, ah, I really like how this looks like, okay? And the YouTube channel is Highway Academy, okay? That's why I showed how we can, I, I shared a video in the group where I showed members how they can automatically put scripts. You can put signs along an expressway or a road or anything automatically using just changes. So if you're, someone has given you changes, you need to put a stop sign, a junction sign, just put everything in an Excel spreadsheet and just run it in Dynamo and it automatically places the blocks perpendicular to the alignment or lighting or anything. So it's, it's, it's very powerful because you find those tasks that take a long time. 
Okay, are there any All right, questions? Yes. I don't think there are any more questions. Um, uh, I think perhaps uh, this is a good uh, is a good session, and I thank you so much for uh, sharing sharing your knowledge and perhaps uh, sparking members' interest in especially automating the tasks they do every day. Mm. And um, in in automation, I am with you on that because I love automation so much. And I know once you automate something, it makes your life a bit easier. And it makes you want to uh, venture more into automation and perhaps always ensuring that uh, you shorten tasks. Yes. So especially like in my experience from where we used to, since I, mean, I, I was in a structural a consultancy mm -hmm. firm, we used to draw profiles using uh, Lisp files. Okay. Then uh, exactly. I decided I decided to learn. Uh, we used to draw profiles and uh, profiles and sections in Lisp files. Mm. Then later on, we I learned Civil 3D, and the boss was amazed at that, how easy it was to yes. do what he had to sit down and code. And uh, mm. Later on, we developed other templates in automating very many things, and it makes life very easy. So we thank you so much for, for this session, and I think we are going to end the meeting in a minute or so. So you can give your closing remarks, and uh, you can break off. Yes, uh, members one, thank you for attending. And um, if anyone has any more questions, uh, I've, shared, I've basically shared with you where you can find me. And I can basically answer most of your questions. I didn't go into the very complex and very simple. Sorry for that, but I was trying to just show you how to automate and do tasks very quickly. So otherwise, I thank everyone for this opportunity, um, for giving me your time. It has been, I think, roughly around two hours, which is longer than it should have been. Sorry about that, but thanks for your time. And I would thank so much for inviting me. Um, if members are interested, we can do another one next time. Definitely they're interested.